Turn your Bibles to the book of Joel, the Minor Prophets. Minor Prophets are a small, small collection of books just prior to the New Testament, the Old Testament. And they're called the Minor Prophets, not because they are minor in doctrine, but because of their size. They are generally very small. Gener Some of them are just one page. So, all right, the book of Joel, let's go to chapter 3. And this is going to be on why the Lord used Greek for the New Testament. All right, let's take a look. Joel chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, a lot of people don't know it, but in these days, the northern kingdom was called Israel, and the southern kingdom was called Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel's capital was Samaria. The southern kingdom's capital was Jerusalem. Different capitals, different kings, different people. Israel was taken into captivity by Assyria, Damascus. I believe Damascus. I'm not sure. Be honest, I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. Um, they never returned to the land. The Assyrians would take somebody from one part of the country and move them to an entirely different part. That's like you conquer the United States. You take all the people from New York, you move them to California. You take the people from California, you move them to Florida. Take the people from Kentucky and move them to New York. And the reason they would do this is so that you didn't know the land area that where you were. I mean, it's let's face it, if you were an army that lived in your own country, it helps to know your own landscape and what resources are where. But when they totally move you, that advantage is totally nullified. And they also forbid the people to speak their own language because they didn't want they wouldn't want the Hebrews speaking Hebrew when the Assyrians wouldn't necessarily understand what they were saying and they didn't want them plotting or making a plan against them that they couldn't understand so they were taught the Assyrian language and forbidden to speak Hebrew so, can you imagine if the Russians conquered the United States and they wouldn't want you, you know, they wouldn't want the United States people speaking English saying, hey guys, Russians don't understand what I'm saying. Uh, on Wednesday, let's all get together and kill these Russian soldiers, you know. They wouldn't want that. So they would forbid you to speak English. And they would demand that you be able to speak, they would teach you and demand that you speak Russian. Well, that's what a conqueror would do. Well, the Assyrians conquered Israel, took them out of their land, put them in another part, and forbid them to speak their own language. Now, if this happened, how long, how many generations, how many years would it be before... Uh, you know, the Russians conquered America. How many years would it be before people forgot English and only spoke Russian? I mean, let's face it. If you weren't allowed to speak English under pain of death, they would kill you, you know. And that's what the Assyrians did. They wouldn't let the Hebrews speak Hebrew. Um, there was no religious studies. There was no nothing. They absolutely forbid them to speak Hebrew. You know, how many years would it be before it became a dead language and was forgotten? 
Well, a number of years later, um, Babylon, perhaps you've heard of the book of Daniel, book of Jeremiah, the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar, um, they came in, they conquered the Assyrians, they defeated their army, and the Assyrian Empire collapsed. Well, once the Assyrian Empire collapsed, the um, children of Israel, they're no longer living in their own land, but they didn't want to live with the Assyrians. They figured, well, you know, their armies just collapsed. Their soldiers are not holding us in this country anymore. Maybe we should get out of here. And they did. And um, according to archaeologists and history, uh, do, do your own research. Don't take my word for it. Of course, the history books have been destroyed. I had some old history books from 100 years ago, but they were taken away from me. They were in storage, and a company bought up the storage unit and told me I owed some ungodly money when the contract ran out, so I lost the books. But Israel disappeared from history, and they went to what was called the Caucasus Mountains in what is now, I think, northern Turkey. And the Caucasus Mountains are the gateway to Europe and Russia. So when Israel disappears, that's when the Europeans appear in history. I always thought that was his interesting. Now let's take a look at something. Now here's an interesting verse. In Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 7. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first. Didn't Jesus? Uh, didn't Jesus and the apostles go to Jerusalem and preach to the Jews first, and then they went to the so-called Gentiles? The Lord also saw, shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. All right, so. Let's see, where are we going to go? In the book of Judges, chapter 20, verse 18. And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, Which of us shall go up first? Which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. Judah was to be the tribe of the kings. Let's, let's prove that. All right, let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 51, verse, uh, verse 59. And then we're going to go skip around a little bit, because I don't want to make this a three-hour study. Uh, let's see. The word which Jeremiah the prophet commanded, Sariah, the son of... Neriah, the son of Masiah, when he went with Zedekiah, the king of Judah, Zedekiah, the king of Judah, into Babylon. In the fourth year of his reign, and this Syriah was a quiet prince. Jeremiah 52, verse 3. For though the anger of the Lord forthrew the anger of the Lord, it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah till he had cast them out of his presence that Zedekiah rebelled 
against the king of Babylon. So Zedekiah was the king of Judah. Verse 10. And the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and uh, before his eyes, he slew also all the princes of Judah in Riblah. Verse 27, 52, 27. And the king of Babylon smote them and put them to death in Riblah, in the land of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive out of his own land. So, not a good thing. How about Jeremiah 35, verse 1? The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, all right, so Judah had a bunch of kings. All right, 2 Samuel 2 and 11. And the... And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. 2 Samuel 3.10 To translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the house, the, I'm sorry, and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan even to Beersheba. See, the throne of David over Israel and over Judah. Hmm. Oh, here we go. 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 10. And the king of Israel, okay, and the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. So you got a king of Israel and the king of Judah sat each on his throne, having put on their robes, plural, in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. Oh, let's see. First Kings 22 and verse 41. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Asa, began to reign over Judah, in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. So Asa was the king of Judah, and Ahab was king of Israel. They're not the same, people. Israel went into captivity with Assyria, and they never returned to the land. Judah and Jerusalem went to captivity in Babylon for 70 years, and then the... Um, Persians, modern day Iran, um, conquered the Babylonians, and they allowed Judah, the true Jews, to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the city and the temple. You can read about that in the book of Nehemiah and the book of Ezra. I think Ezra was the priest and Nehemiah was the king. I believe that's how that works. I'm not 100% sure. So, where am I going with all this? Well, let's take a look. All right, here's an interesting verse. Chapter 49, verse 10. Genesis. The scepter. Now, what was a scepter? A scepter is... Um, It's something a king holds in his hand. A scepter would have a seal of the king, oftentimes. All right, let's define scepter. An ornamental staff, it's a noun, comes from the Greek. An ornamental staff carried by rulers on ceremonial occasions as a symbol of sovereignty. To be sovereign means to be a ruler. Let's see, a rod or wand born in the hand as a symbol of legal, regal or imperial power. 
royal or imperial power or, or authority, sovereignty, to give a scepter to invest with authority. Uh, it's related to a Greek verb that means to prop oneself or lean on something since a scepter is something that a ruler can lean on. So it is, it's kind of like a staff or a rod, but it's a symbol of authority. Okay, and it has little, slightly different spellings. Um, in English, we would spell it S-C-E-P-T-E-R. The Brits, who don't know how to spell, by the way, uh, would spell it S-C-E-P-T-R-E. -E. You know, we spell color C-O-L-O-R. The Brits spell it C-O-L-O-U-R. And that's a joke, by the way. All right, so. Genesis 49.10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, the king, nor a lawgiver from be between his feet. That was Levi. They were the, the lawgivers. Uh, Moses was a Levite. They were the priest tribe. Judah was the tribe of the kings. Levi was the tribe of priests that served the Lord. They were the ones that gave the law of the Lord. The Ten Commandments, Moses, Le Aaron, Levi, okay? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, the king, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. What is Shiloh? Well, that's, it's from the same root word as shalom, which means peace, but it means tranquility. And it is an epithet of the Messiah. Christ would have been known as Shiloh. You know, Christ is called the Prince of Peace. Well, there you go. So the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his peace, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, in Genesis 17 and verse 6, God speaking to Abraham. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee. Nations, plural. And kings shall come out of thee. And Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and he had... Twelve tribes, right? Of which Judah was one, the tribe of the kings, and Levi was another tribe, and that was the tribe of the priests that served the Lord. Genesis 35, 11. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations, plural, shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. You know, what's interesting is almost a great majority of the kings of Europe, I don't care what country you went to, virtually, they were all, almost all of them were of German blood. The king of Russia, German. King of Sweden, German. Denmark, German. Did you know that the King of England, George I and George II, perhaps you've heard of King George, the American Revolution, King George was uh, on the throne when uh, the United States did their revolution against England. King George I, the King of England, 
did not even know the English language. Can you believe that? The king of England did not know the language of the company, of the country that he was king of. He spoke German. Germany fulfills this pro you know, the prophecy of you know the rulers, the kings. Um, of course, the wicked ones have gotten rid of almost all the kings of Europe. But, um, you know, I just thought that's an interesting point. And Germany was to be, I mean, Judah was to be first in war. Judah was the, the king, and they were to be the warlike tribe. And do you know that Germany, well, you had World War I, you had World War II. It took the entire world to destroy. To, to beat Germany. I mean, in World War II, you had Russia, the United States, England. You had, I mean, United States was the number one industrial power in the world. Russia was number two. Germany was number three. And I've talked to soldiers that fought in World War II, and they said that the Germans were probably the greatest, the best soldiers that they'd ever seen. I mean, they were outnumbered like 10 to 1 on the final days of the war. I don't know. Was um, In the Assyrian Empire, they took northern Israel, but they also took parts of Judah, too. Uh, captivity. The Babylonians took the rest of Judah, and they took Jerusalem. Let's take a look at that real quick. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 13. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. Mm. So he took parts of... Uh, parts of Judah. But if you read in Isaiah 37, you'll see that uh, the king of the Assyrians was not allowed to take Jerusalem. That was done in the days of Jeremiah. You can read the book of Jeremiah. So, let's take a look. Let's go back to Joel chapter 3. Verse 1. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations. Is that Israel and Judah? I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. You know, this is talking about the end time stuff. The Valley of Jehoshaphat. Verse 3. Joel 3.3 3. And they have cast lots for my people. And have given a boy for an harlot, and sold a girl for wine, that they may, might drink. So here it is, they sold the boys and the girls as slaves. Sold a girl for a bottle of wine. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon? Tyre and Zidon were... Um, settled by the children of Ham. And I think the Canaanites, too. You know, you got to realize, 
people were all mixed up in those days. I mean, you probably had a, uh, just like America is today, you know, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, America was, you know, if you were an American, you were a, a wasp, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Um, but that was many, many years ago. So, 65 years, 66 years later, um, you go down to Miami, you're a Cuban. Because that's about all that lives down there now. Not very many wasps running around. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? In other words, if you give me something, I'm going to repay you back. You know, you give me something bad, I'm going to give it right back to you. I'm going to re repay you with your own stuff. Verse 5, because ye have taken my silver and my gold. Yeah, they went to the Lord's temple and they took his silver and gold out of his temple. Because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. Listen carefully. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Who did this? Tyre and Zidon. Read about that in verse 4. Okay, remember we read that how they had sold the, the boys for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink? Didn't we just read that? The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians. See, they took the children of Judah and Jerusalem and they sold them as slaves unto the Grecians that ye might remove them far from their border. Well, the Grecians, that's just another way of saying the Greeks... The Grecians. Do you know that there were the children of Judah and children of Jerusalem that had been sold into captivity to the Greeks as slaves? Isn't that interesting? Did you know the New Testament was written in Greek? Why? Could this be the reason why? I think so, among others. So, and let me tell you something. When you buy a slave, are you going to learn the slave's language? Or are you going to make the slave learn your language so that you can communicate with them? You know, you're not going to learn, if you were a Greek, a Grecian, you're not going to learn Hebrew to be able to tell the Hebrew slave that you just bought, oh, go out into my field and uh, pick the apples off the apple tree or, you know, go get the grapes off the vine or... Uh, go plow the field. No. You're going to teach the Hebrews Greek. And you're going to tell them in your language, go out my field and work. Well, I sit home here and drink my wine, right? And like I've mentioned before, you don't want the slaves speaking in their own language when you don't understand it because you're afraid that they're going to rise up, rebel, and fight against you. So, you know, that's a thing. In the days of Christ, they were speaking Aramaic, which is a, a language that came from Hebrew. It's very similar. It's a dialect. I mean, if you took somebody from Georgia... Would y'all like some Gertiets and send them up to New York? Hey, yo, I'm from the Big Apple. You know, they might have trouble speaking to each other. They're both speaking English. 
but uh, you know it's a different dialect almost I guess you could say but the thing is the point is the children of Judah and Jerusalem were sold to the Grecians the Greeks what was the New Testament written in Greek not Hebrew I don't care what the Hebrew roots liars say there's not one Hebrew manuscript of the New Testament that's ancient but there are thousands over 5,000 ancient Greek manuscripts that are many 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 hundreds of years old so what can I tell you in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5 and God speaking to Israel now therefore if big if if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine in Jeremiah 11 and verse 10 they who's they Israel they are turned back to the iniquities sin okay they are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers which refused to hear my words and they went after other gods to serve them the house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant which I made with their fathers and the churches love to say oh well God's got an everlasting covenant with the Jews well the house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant which I made with their fathers that's right God's got an everlasting covenant but the house of Israel and the house of Judah broke it God didn't break it they broke it and do you know what God's remedy was it's in Jeremiah verse 3 and verse uh, chapter 3 and verse 8 and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce what and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery spiritual adultery I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not but went and played the harlot also God divorced Israel Jeremiah 5 verse 11 for the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me saith the Lord so why was the so why was the New Testament written in Greek the answer is given to us by Jesus Matthew 21 verse 43 therefore say I and who's Jesus speaking to he's speaking to the Jews therefore say I unto you the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof maybe that's why the New Testament was written in Greek how about Matthew 23 verse 15 Jesus is speaking to the Jews here woe unto you scribes and Pharisees now, just remember all Pharisees are Jews woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte and when he is made ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves yeah Tyre and Sidon took the children of Judah sold them to the Greeks as slaves 
There were children of Judah in Greece when Jesus was walking the earth. And a lot of people don't know it, but Greece had conquered that area. Matter of fact, under Alexander the Great, prior to the Roman Empire, they had conquered the almost the entire Mediterranean. Greece was, Greek was the common language of commerce, of business in those days. Now, the Roman Empire had came down and had, you know, recently conquered the area. So, if you were an Israelite and you went to the temple or the synagogue on, on the Sabbath, you would be listening to the service in Hebrew or Aramaic, as it may be. But when you went to go buy things from the common people, you would know Greek. But when you went to do legal stuff with the Roman Empire, the Roman government, you would need somebody that knew Latin. And, you know, it used to be if you were an American, everybody spoke English. Well, that's not the case anymore. Um, there's a school up in Minnesota, they were complaining that there was like 60 or 70 different languages spoken in school. I mean, you know, you go down to Miami, Florida, if you don't know Spanish, um, you can't even get a job, period. They won't hire you. You were born here? Well, we don't care. You don't speak Spanish. I mean, it's the de facto language of Miami. Matter of fact, I drove through Los Angeles and uh, was listening, trying to listen to the radio. There were more Spanish radio stations than there were English ones. So, um, all right, let's go back to Joel chapter 3 and verse 6. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Now remember, in verse 1, we read, For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. See, one day God is going to gather his people. And I know the churches will try to trick you and make you think that the United Nations gathered all the Jews and put them into what they call the Israeli state. I'm sorry, but the United Nations is not my God. Maybe it's the God of the Jews. Um, there are some Jews that will tell you that Zionism is not of God. They say, no, that the Messiah is going to gather us. But these are the religious Jews. And then you got your Zionists, which are basically Jews in name only. I mean, most of them don't even believe. They don't even believe the, the, the Bible. They, you know, it's funny. They don't believe in God, and they don't keep the law, but they believe that God gave them the land. If you could figure that one out, I'd sure appreciate uh, your explaining that to me. Well, I understand. It it's, has reference to um, the wheat and the tares. All right, so the children of Judah and Jerusalem were sold to the Greeks. Verse 7, Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them. See, God's going to bring them back. And will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. So there's going to be a time when uh, basically they sold the children of Judah to the Greeks. Well, then the Lord's going to have the children of Judah sell the people that sold them, 
have them sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off. All right, so who were the Sabaeans? Um, they were an old ancient people, according to um, the dictionary, who spoke the Arabian language, and they were identified as the biblical land of Sheba. You've heard of the Queen of Sheba? And it's in the area of what is called Yemen, in the uh, that peninsula down there the Arabian Peninsula. So, we're talking about an Arabic people, I guess. And I will sell your sons and your daughters, the people who sold the, the Hebrews. This is a judgment upon them. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the, hands of the, into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken it. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Now, I believe this is the end times. The, 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 uh, when the Lord gathers all the nations to destroy them. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say... I am strong. Positive confession. You ever hear that among the charismatics? Oh, yeah. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. You know, we read almost the same exact language in the book of Revelation. Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, we're going to go there um, in a second. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get ye down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Let's take a look at uh, the book of Zechariah. You know, these people that call themselves New Testament Christians, they're idiots. They're deceived idiots. There is more prophecy in the Old Testament than there is in the New Testament. Well, we're New Testament Christians. We don't read that Old Testament. That's for the Jews. Really? Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 1. Listen to this. Prophecy coming. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. All right. Well, this is this happened. Uh, in, well, this was future then, but it's it's past now. So now the Lord's going to switch from the past to the future for Zechariah fourteen three. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day. What day? The day of the Lord, day of Christ. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Christ is going to return to the Mount of Olives, people. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Matter of fact, read Matthew 24. They were right there on the Mount of Olives. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall fly to flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azai. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. 
and the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. This is the second coming. Uh, check this out. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. We, we read a lot about that. Um, I think it's in the book of Joel. It says the, 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 the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon shall not give her light. Um, it's in the book of Revelation. It's in Matthew 24. I mean, it's in Zechariah. I mean, I could make a whole study on just that. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem. Living waters. Where do we read about that? I could make a whole study out of living water. John 4.10 The woman at the well. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have, have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Verse 11 The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hath thou that living water? And Jesus answered, you know. And in John 7 and verse 38, Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, let's see. Jeremiah 2.13 For my people have committed two evils. Two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out of cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Okay, Jeremiah 17.13 O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. And we just read, you know, Zechariah 14 and verse 8, but how about Revelation 7 and, let's see, Revelation 7. Yeah, let's see. Let me take a look. Uh, verse 15. Revelation 7, 15. And people will try to tell you that Revelation, the book of Revelation is in chronicle, chronological order. It's not. It skips around. Because if it did... This would be the end. Let's go to Let's go to twelve. Now thirteen. Revelation seven thirteen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? So you see people in white robes, right? And I said to him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the front throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Hmm. Zechariah 14, verse 8. 
Um, oh, let's see. Oh, let's go back to verse 6. Zechariah 14, 6. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. Shall there be one Lord and his name one. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place, from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's winepress. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall no more, and shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Now that's future. Now listen to this. This is really interesting. This is what's going to happen to the those that fight against the Lord. Zechariah 14, 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. And we're not talking about present-day Jerusalem. We're talking about the Lord's Jerusalem. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. You know, every time I read this, I think about the um, when Sarah Connor of the Terminator movie, when she was in the playground, and the uh, there was a, the nuke explosion, and all the flesh just burned away from off their bodies, and it was just basically the skeletons that collapsed. I mean, that is, their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and, on, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horse, and of the mule, and of the camel, and of the ass, and of all the beasts that shall be in the, these tents, as this plague. And it shall come to pass, that every one of them that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. Do you know that in the kingdom, we're going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles? Oh, yeah. How do I know that? Because we're not doing it now. Not really. There's, there's a remnant that do, but... Verse 17. And it, shall, and it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Well, kind of hard to grow crops and eat when you don't have any rain. You know that? And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feasts of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Looks like that's going to be pretty important, don't it? And this is future, people. Listen to this, verse 20. And in that day there shall be upon the belts of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Listen carefully. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. They're not holiness now. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them, and see if see if therein. And in that day, and in that day, what day? The, the late day of the Lord. And in that day, there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Whoa. And in that day, there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. All right, turn to Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good field in his, seal, in his field. So, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, or weeds, and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst, thou not, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? And he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Verse, let's go to verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. In other words, you told us a story, but we don't understand it. Explain this to us. Verse 7, 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom but the tares are the children of the wicked one. I wish people would understand who these Canaanites are. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered together and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Revelation 14 and verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to them that sat on the cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and reap. Remember, the harvest is the end of the world. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. 
And he that sat on the cloud thrust in the sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Ooh. All right, let's go back to Joel chapter 3. We'll get through this. Verse 13. Verse 12. Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near, in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. I mean, this is right out of Matthew 24, book of Revelation. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem, then shall Jerusalem be holy. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. Not now, people. And there shall no strangers pass through her any more. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Egypt, Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse her blood that I have not cleansed. For the Lord dwelleth in Zion. And that's that's what that's that's what she wrote, people. That's what he wrote. All right. Well, this is uh. Why was the Bible written in Greek? Children of Judah and Jerusalem went to Greece as slaves. And the Lord harvest wanted to harvest his vine. Just remember in John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. All right, well, this is the end of this Bible study. This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.